So today we're up to class 10. We want to I want to go through the storm surge article and then go through the notes. There's going to be some redundancy here because we're going to go back over through the class notes what we covered in the articles on mold and storm surge, give a good summary and then what are the linkages between the two and then we'll 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 start on catastrophe risk. We probably won't get too far on catastrophe risk. So last class we finished with the mold issue. What I want to do today, there's this is a really good article on the issue of storm surge, which happened um, several years after this, after the mold issue. Storm surge is another one of those issues like mold that was a huge issue and then it died away. So again, my goal is not to make you an expert on mold and storm surge. There's still issues and they might come up in some state sometime in the future but more to understand the specific issues of when the property casualty industry is under siege by the courts, by politicians, and it, and again, I was emphasizing the last class, it's the contract language. You see it right here. If you force insurance companies to rewrite their contracts retroactively, you are priced, the actuaries are pricing based on a certain interpretation of the language. Remember, the language is dictated by the states. But just because the legislators have a certain idea of what the language means, that doesn't mean the courts have to interpret that way. Even though the legislator is part of the government, the courts are part of the government, the two do not have to be in agreement, and the courts can decide however they want to decide it. They may take a, a, a different reading of the language and make different, make different um, conclusions and require insurance companies to do certain things. We'll actually see in some, some cases uh, courts will actually make decisions as as a way to provide a remedy when there is no good remedy, and they they their solution is hey let's let's at least we'll make the insurance companies pay something they maybe legally aren't really required to pay, but we, we got to fix the situation somehow. So the courts the courts have their own ability to interpret and and make decisions that can retroactively make an insurance product extremely unprofitable. A product the insurance company would have never written with that interpretation. And storm surge fits into that. We saw with mold, it was the interpretation of what kind of what what kind of event would would damage from mold be covered by insurance? Is it a health risk or not? Should it be should it be covered many, many, many years after a peril, a covered peril happened, or should there be some time constraint? So it's language interpretation. So we'll go back, you know, thinking back to 2005. So uh, you may not remember this. You might have just been uh, in in uh, kindergarten at this time, but it was a big hurricane. Hurricane hit uh, Katrina hit the eastern shore, shore southeastern shore of the United States, especially New Orleans was the most the most well known because of all the all the videos that came from there. But there are other places that were hit as well, pretty dramatically. So hurricane. Katrina hit in 2005, it brought a huge storm surge. So what is storm surge? Well, you watch the videos on earthquakes and hurricanes, so you, you've got a sense of what storm surge is, and you saw the importance of how fast the coast rises to when the water comes in as far as the size of the storm surge. And New Orleans in particular is a very unique place given that it's actually under sea level and it's protected by these, these walls. Uh, storm surge is a huge issue for them. And so storm surge is flood. It is not hurricane, so it is not covered by the home homeowner's policy. You have to have a separate flood coverage damage to have flood coverage. So the question is, what is what is a storm surge, which isn't covered by homeowners? And what is the wind, the hurricane wind that is covered by homeowners? So insurance companies have always interpreted storm surge as being flood that is not covered. So this guy Scruggs, pretty, pretty important person. He's the one that made the headlines for suing tobacco industry. And he collected fees of around 800 million. So he decided to try it again. And this time he was going to go against the property and casualty insurance industry. It went really bad for him. He ended up having to plead guilty for trying to bribe judges, having to spend time in, uh, in jail. So conspiring to bribe a judge, 
Uh, he's under an investigation for some other. I don't know what his. You know, I should look it up and see if you know what his jail time was. You kind of have to wonder why someone who made eight hundred million dollars a few years later is now pushing the envelope to try to get a ten or twenty million more out of the insurance industry. Kind of bizarre. So I'm going to skip through this. You have more underwriting, underlining that you might go through and see. But I want to bring specifically what this had to do with State Farm because it's pretty interesting. So storm surge was covered only to the degree that residents had flood insurance. And the caps on flood insurance, you know, the statutory cap, cap $350,000. You think about some of these really nice houses on the coast, $350 million, $350,000 $350, for a house that may be worth $1 or $2 million is just not going to be adequate. So... There's people that have huge losses, and the insurance industry is coming back and saying, you know, 60% of the loss is due to flood and 40% is wind damage. So we'll cover $500,000 of your losses. But the other $1.5 million, you needed to have flood insurance, and your flood insurance would have only covered three fifty. dollars So since people could be out more than a million dollars. So this Scruggs guy, he steps in. He wanted to... Uh, hatch a plan to make private insurers pay for all the damage, whether it was flood or wind, no matter what the contract said. So State Farm's seemingly airtight clause excluded, and this is what it said, flood, surface water, waves, tidal water, tsunami, sage, overflow of a body of water, or spray from any of these, and then this last part's key, all weather driven by wind or not. That's what storm surge is. It's water that's driven by wind. And Scruggs' argument was their contract did not use the word storm surge. Since their contract did not say storm surge, even though it's well defined here. So, you know, hey, they didn't say storm surge, so storm surge is covered. Uh, they should have used exactly those wor words. The other issue is figuring out how much of the loss was when and how much is flood. This is where State Farm got themselves in trouble. So you would just think that these homes obviously suffered, suffered wind damage and then the storm surge would come in. So the, so you would think, you know, at least 40, 50 percent of damage must be wind because the wind was pretty strong. The problem is there's no one there at the time to actually see what happened. Um, it may be interesting if they had video cameras on the coast so that you can maybe even see it visually, but they didn't have that. All they knew was they show up the next day and there's nothing but a concrete slab. So the whole house has been destroyed and they don't know how much is wind and how much is flood. So, so it's clear that the insurers were on the hook, but the question was how much. So once the surge reduced everything to a slab, it's impossible to tell what happened, but there are engineers, there are models that that can tell you how much is what versus the others. If they couldn't see any evidence of wind damage, they could conceivably offer no money at all on the homeowner's policy. So here's where here's where State Farm gets in trouble. This gentleman had come across two engineering reports by this engineering firm. She claimed have been incompletely formed. Their engineers had attributed damage solely to wind, where adjusters had previously documented extensive flood damage. So here, what she's finding is some of these engineering reports from the same company were very beneficial to policyholders and harmful to State Farm, and others were more beneficial to State Farm and harsh on the, uh, the policyholders. So the firm's president talked to King in giving the company another chance by having a second engineer re-inspect each site the two engineers who had written the controversial report, they left the company. At least 20 of the reports were revised after reinspection. The dispute ever the dispute ever since has been whether King was angry about the work that they did or about their conclusions. So it's like, okay, this is really bad engineering, and maybe that was the case. Who knows? Maybe that maybe their report that showed it was all wind damage. So you know that there's no way it's all wind damage. That's a very shot a report or were, were they looking and saying hey you know what um, if we say it's all wind damage it's going to cost us several more billion dollars um, and we've got these two contradictory reports 
let's redo them. And obviously the firm that's providing this work, they, they don't want to lose business with State Farm, so they have a monetary incentive. And so State Farm has it, but right now that's private information. No one knows about it. And then these two sisters show up, the Rigsby sisters. Great last name, Rigsby, Rigsby sisters. They work for State Farm, and they notice these conflicting engineering reports. So they began photocopying these documents. And boy, you, you guys probably don't remember photocopying but boy, I remember spending my life standing at the photocopying machine, and you can do it. You can sit there and copy 500 pages, and no one, no one asked a question. That's just what we did back then. We copied, copied, copied. So they sat there, and uh, a few days later, Scruggs showed uh, the attorney general. So now it's getting political. The two engineer reports, and who it became a, began a criminal investigation of State Farm. And even, even another, the U.S. attorney, attorney. So even the federal government, and the federal government is going to get more involved here in a little bit. The the, Hig, the Rigsby sister alleged that the insurers were fraudulently shifting Katrina's liabilities to the national flood. So this is a pretty serious criminal charge. This is, and there's a whistleblower laws that if the Rigsby sisters can show that there was fraud, they can get a percentage of the money. So if a whistleblower gets 15, 20 to 25% of what the government recruits, so we're talking about billions of dollars here. And so these two sisters, if they could show that State Farm illegally shifted their engineering reports in order to shift more of the costs of this, these claims to the flood program, which is a federal government program, they could have come out very, very, very wealthy. State Farm had no idea these sisters were doing that. They downloaded more than 6,000 pages uh, from the company's database. How a company would not know people were doing that. They made two copies of each. Now, this is not inconsequential. Cost, you know, uh, if they did all the copying at, at State Farm, that was clearly a violation of their employment contract and the fact that they were sharing it. If they copied these outside the co company, that's probably about $1,000 worth of copies. Copies back then were about 10, 10 cents a page. So... They gave a set the hood, and they put another set aside for Scruggs. Um, after they did all that, they told State Farms. They told the super supervisor what they were, what they did. They were terminated, and they were immediately hired by Scruggs as consultants for one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, where no one they really had no duties at all. That's also illegal. You can't a lawyer can't can't pay. Um, someone who's providing him uh, information, illegal information, confidential information, hire them as if they're workers. That's just not. So you can't pay fact witnesses for their testimony. Scruggs might have said you hired them to make copies because that seems to be something they were, they were really skilled at, but you can't do that. So now Scruggs was also scoring victories. The, there's two U.S. congressmen who came as clients the most important one was Trent Lott. You probably don't remember Trent Lott. Very well known. Uh, boy, he his end of his career was really quite quite unspectacular. He had some really serious problems at the very end. Um, but he had a brother. Uh, you know, he had property that was damaged, and he was Scruggs' brother-in-law. So it, it's almost like a um, a soap opera here. So Lott and Taylor, these two congressmen. They began supporting legislator legislation that would further support Scruggs in, in particular to make make uh, the flood part of Katrina liable to insurance companies. So, and you know, you hear what some of these people say. There was some definite illegal activity going on. But your comment that you will dedicate. Your next term of office to, office of bringing down State Farm, this is what Trent Lott is saying, through all means available to you, including legislation designed to harm the industry, was very unsettling to say the least. Um, and especially given that they're saying this, especially Lott, for personal reasons. This is like a personal vendetta. He's going to use his power as a member of Congress to bring down his vengeance on State Farm because he doesn't like the claim he, he received. Scruggs began settlement talks with State Farms. Here you can see where Scruggs really messed up. 
So by early November, they reached a tentative deal where State Farm would pay about $80 million and the Lars would get 26.5. So again, this is a guy who made $800 million suing the tobacco companies. And here he's skirting the law to try to get an extra $26.5 million. But State Farm says, we're, we're not cutting any checks until Hood drops the criminal charges. So State Farm says, hey, we're fine, we'll pay you, we're, we'll say we're civilly liable, but we will not say we're criminally liable, you've got to get Hood. So now Scruggs has a problem. He's gotten, he's brought Hood into this, he's got, he has the federal government after him, he has all these people bringing this criminal process against State Farm, and he wants his $26.5 million, but he's not getting it until he can unwind everything he started. So, now Hood knows and that he cannot tie a criminal investigation to a civil one. So he can't, there's no, that's just not legal. And he even says that. I don't want to even talk about criminal investigation, but it certainly appears the people that are there, that's what was going on. Uh, the state's deputy insurance commissioner who was at these negotiations, they, Hood, they saw Hood's linking of the civil and criminal matter, matters at the time was both explicit and outrageous. They claim Hood said, if they don't settle with it with us, I'm going to indict them all. That You cannot do that. <laughs> um, you can't tell someone, hey, pay me $100,000 or we're, we're taking you to court for murder. If, if you don't pay us $100,000, we are going to convict you. If you do pay us $100,000, we'll drop the murder charge. You can't do that. That's illegal. So Scruggs was impatient to get his $26.5 million. Uh, so Scruggs, now what he's going to do is say, you know what? I bet I can get Hood to drop these charges if I make a large donation to his political campaign. So he has this guy, Balducci, and his business partner, um, 500000 if they would meet with Hood and persuade him to drop the investigation. Balducci told Hood that even if he didn't call, if he didn't call to probes, Krugs would fund, uh, was fund a different candidate to run against them for attorney general. All of this is robbery and illegal. So Balducci's working for Scrubs and going out there and, and trying to um, uh, get Hood to drop the charges so that State Farm will settle. And then State Farm, they're like, okay, we're done. We're just going to go ahead and go directly to our policyholders. We'll go to this insurance commissioner. And we'll make a we'll make a deal. They weren't admitting that that homeowners covered storm surge. So be real clear on that in your answer. State Farm is not saying, "Hey, we admit we should be covering storm surge." What they were admitting was that their engineering report was too rosy for State Farm, and that and they came back of that off of that and said, "No, there was more wind damage than we admit, and we're going to pay that." Um, and so they just went straight to the state commissioner and said, we'll, we'll, we'll decide this between you. We'll keep the lawyers out. Um, so they would get policy would get everything they were promised from Scruggs, except for Scruggs would not get anything, uh, no legal fees on the other side. So, uh, by the end of 2007, State Farm had paid out 73, remember they told Scruggs, uh, 80 million. So on March 28, Balucci met with Lackey and said he considered a personal favor if Lackey would rule. So here he's meeting with a judge and asked the judge to rule in favor of Scruggs. He added that when Lackey retired, he hoped he would take an, a, take an of counsel position with Balucci's firm. Again, bribery. A, this is Lackey. We get a monthly stipend. Though he kept a poker face at the meeting, Lackey later notified the FBI and offered tape recorder, rec, tape record further calls with uh, Bellucci. Uh, so Bellucci uh, bribed the wrong person here. Um, William Acker, a judge overseeing this case, recommended that Scruggs be prosecuted for criminal contempt for allegedly violating an order he had entered requiring return of all the documents. Acker suggested that Scruggs disobeyed the order to further plot a plot in which Scruggs and Hood had teamed up to bully State Farm in the civil and criminal, criminal, criminal settlements. A tape meeting, September 21st, Lackey asked Balducci for $40,000 in exchange for an order he wanted. After contacting Scruggs' offer, Balducci agreed. He delivered the payment. The, the FBI arrested him. Balducci discussed with Scruggs whether Lackey's draft order was the way he wanted. And 
uh, Scruggs told uh, and told him Lackey wanted an extra 10000 and Scruggs says, I'll take care of that. Balducci told FBI that he helped Scruggs try to bribe a different judge um, a, you know, a year after this hurricane. So uh, Scruggs is, you know, it's interesting. He's doing something that's so obviously criminal, and he's a very wealthy man. You just have to wonder uh, what's going on with these people's minds. So before Election Day, Scruggs... Um, a close associate and two lawyers contributed four hundred seventy-two thousand uh, dollars to the Democratic Attorney General Association, which gave five hundred fifty thousand dollars to Hood's campaign. Hood's total donation was about seven thirty-nine thousand. So, um, you know, it's a big part of what helped Hood win re-election. Um, this is the industry. If you're an actuary and you're walking in this industry, this is an incredibly political industry. It's very different. Last semester, I thought life insurance. Life insurance is very different. Life insurance, for the most part, most part stays out of the political world. There's definitely regulators stepping on life insurance companies for bad settlement practices, but it doesn't usually hit the press too badly. A little bit did back a few years with what, what they called vanishing premiums in the life insurance industry, and there were some big lawsuits there. But it wasn't the same as what you see here because... Homeowners insurance and auto insurance is a much more personal insurance. You're required by law to get auto insurance. You have to get homeowners insurance if you're going to, if you're going to have a mortgage of any kind. You don't have to buy life insurance. You don't have to buy annuities. So this industry sells a product that is essentially required. You don't you don't really have much choice. And so because of that. Um, Politicians like to step in because they can say, look what I did for, for my, my policyholders. So let's go back to the class notes, page 22 of the class notes, 20, the bottom of 21 through 22. So let's just do a quick what I'm looking for on the exam questions. So um, first of all is some background. And so let me go through just some of the facts. Make sure you have these. These are in your notes. So we're talking about mold in Texas and storm surge on the East Coast. The key is for the mold especially is frequency and severity. So for mold, most of this is about mold in this section. You have the consumer groups, you have the insurers, the realtors, the lawyers, the regulators, legislatures. So the positions of the consumer group, they wanted mold coverage. Now this one percent, I, I should explain. I have some numbers in here. I don't, I don't do a good job explaining. Their their insurance wanting mold coverage is a not a large percentage. I use one percent here because that's the number of people who filed mold claim mold claims. But ninety nine percent of homeowners never filed a, a mold claim. So consumers groups that say insured want this coverage, do they really know that ninety nine percent have never had a, a claim? And if 99% never have a claim and it has to be covered, then that 99% is going to have to pay for the other 1%. So it's it's interesting, you know, always remember this. This is probably key to really get into your answer is if there's a large loss like this going on, insurance companies don't eat these losses. They raise their premiums. So if they're seeing larger losses, they raise their premiums. And so these 99% who never file a mold claim will see their premiums rise. Remember that 40 to 60% rise in premiums? That's going to hit everyone, including those who never file a claim. So the, the say we want the insurance industry to cover that, the insurance company covers it by charging their policyholders. So it's a pass-through. So I think that's always important to understand with insurance. It's not like they're going to start paying all these extra claims and just leave the, the policy, their policyholder alone. They're going to raise their rates quite significantly. The final state uh, compromise on mold, you want to know that. We'll, we'll summarize that here pretty soon. Um, and then the key issue is when a, a PNC contract is interpreted differently than what the actuaries intend. What can insurance companies do? They can raise rates and insure it as interpreted, but then states have rate regulation. So you remember a lot of these companies were, were using Lloyd's and County Mutuals in, or, in order to avoid the benchmark rate. But if you had to get approval, remember we've got the courts and we've got the legislators, you've got the insurance commissioners. They don't have to all agree. So if the courts say you've got to pay all this extra in claims, 
So that gives you a rational reason for raising your rates, but the commissioner might say, no, we don't, we're not going to approve that. So that one's a tough one. So they use unregulated companies to try to get around that. They can leave the market or limit their business using the HOA, which is what a lot of them did, farmers and a lot of other companies. Um, then the question is, can the states mandate that they stay in business? And for a lot of states, they can't force a company to stay in their state, but they can tell a company that if you leave our state on homeowners, we will reject your license on auto insurance. And again, I think that always sounds unconstitutional to me. Um, for lo lobbying for change, especially realtors, they just wanted a solution. Remember their, their point was, hey, we don't care what you guys do, you just fix the problem. Let's put limits on coverage, change the language, uh, on storm surge, it's not changing the language. It's making sure the language that's there is interpreted correctly. So you saw the definition State Farm was using. You might even copy that into your answer because it's, I think it's very, very clear, clear. It's any water damage, even if it's blown in by wind, is not covered by homeowners. Texas did change the language on mold and clarify the language. The language on storm surge was not changed. So, yeah, so insurance companies can lobby for changes. They might use the realtors to help with that lobbying because if they leave the market, obviously realtors are going to support them. So this is a pretty high level discussion. We'll get into more detail here. You have the two articles on mold and one article on storm surge. Um, so how lawyers can corrupt the process and also expose ins issues for insurances, insurers practices. Because of the uncertainty of storm surge, it just lends itself a bad practice by insurance companies because it's really unsure how do you split between wind and flood. The plaintiff hires their own engineers to assess between wind and flood. So you got the insurance company, you got the plaintiffs, they're all debating and there's not really any great standards on how to do this. Very subjective so there's really no way to know which caused the damage. That's why I'm, you know, it seems like they should put some pretty sturdy cameras on the coast so that if a hurricane comes in, you can actually see what caused the damage. Um, now, key here for our storm surge is the states, there's never been a court case where the insurance industry has lost where they had to cover storm surge. So that's why it's really, really important on State Farm. While they settled for that about $80 million, they weren't settling to cover storm surge. They were settling because they had understated wind damage. So be real clear on that. So uh, if states did reinterpret the contract to force insurance companies to cover storm surge, homeowners insurance would never would not be offered on the coast of Texas. It would not be affordable for those living on the coast. And homeowners insurers, they would the states might not approve it, they'd be losing so much money, they would just completely leave the market. And they might completely leave a, leave a state like Mississippi or, or Florida or or Texas. Texas is a bigger state as far as landmass, so hurricanes is a smaller percentage, but still hurricanes like Harvey can be huge. Um, insurance companies would just have to stop riding homeowners on the coast altogether or even leave total states. So the bottom line is insurance company insurance is pooling of resources. Insurers pass claims on the policyholders via premiums. The insurers will make their cost of capital. They might have one bad year like we saw with uh, Warren Buffett in 2001, but over the long term, they will make their cost of capital. So if claims go up, if the states reinterpret contracts such that claims go up, the insurance company is either going to raise their rates or they're going to stop writing the business. That's true for both mold and for storm surge. So that's the overlap here. So on mold, let's go back to mold. I should have said this was mold here, but this is mold. So give me some background. Uh, Texas had this benchmark system that allows you to, to be within 30% of the benchmark above or below. Does not apply to these special Lloyd types of companies. So while Texas was regulating its rates, the actual insurance companies were charging much more than that because they were in these unregulated subsidiaries. Texas already had the highest rates in the country. 83% higher than the average for the rest of the country. And then mold was going to add another 40 to 60% of that. 
The problem is the interpretation of the Texas policy. It was different than other states. Um, this language, water damage resulting from continuous and repeated seepage. Um, there was no time constraint. Other states had a time constraint. You then got all this media attention with the Ballards. Uh, you now, that's the reason I had you watch that video, so you get their side of the argument. You have these unscrupulous contractors who are coming in, causing fear for homeowners to gut their house, to get rid of all this mold. Um, and you have a claim covered by an insurer without being able to, to, to chain, challenge it. So, you know, these contractors are coming in and say you have mold and, you know, you what is the insurance company going to do? You have this report, the homeowner is now scared to death, and you saw with the Ballards that you're sued for millions and millions of dollars, what are you going to do? So what the insurance did, insurance industry did is they just stopped writing policies. They switched from the HBO, which is all risk, to an HOA, which is just a very, very basic, basic coverage. And so insurers were canceling Anytime anyone filed a claim, insurance companies were just saying, we cancel, we cancel. So people stopped filing claims. Real key in your answer is to talk about frequency and severity. We said frequency went up fivefold and severity went up from 3,000 to 38,000. So remember frequency is the, I didn't put that here, but frequency is the number of claims. And severity is the average claim. And both of those skyrocketed, and that's the reason insurance industry is asking for these 40 to 60 percent increase because of that. Even though it's only one percent of the policyholders, when you see these type of huge increases, that one percent that's filing claims, those are huge numbers. You want to talk about the players? Anytime you see players, what I think is key to your, your answer is incentives. What are their incentives? What's the incentive of insurance companies? Well, they want to pay their claims and they know if their claims go up, they can get higher premiums, but they, they don't want their premiums to get so high that, that their policyholders can't afford them. And they especially don't want to increase their premiums 40, 60 percent for that 1 percent who never, never file a claim. And now they're going to either cut back on their insurance or you know, maybe get much higher limits. You know, there's, there's things that consumers can do to, to offset that, especially the 99 percent that, that don't file claims. You have two consumer groups. One group, they file these claims. They're getting a lot of money off of this. Their lawyers are saying, hey, we want to be covered. And they, they say they're representing all insureds, but there's 99% of insureds that don't have any problem with mold. They're perfectly fine with the policies they have. They don't want to see their rates go up 40 to 60%. Real estate brokers, they just want it fixed. Mortgage break brokers, just bankers, they just want it fixed so that they can sell houses and, and loan money. Home builders, construction and home repair issues that they were doing shoddy work. Regulators and legislators. I didn't put in there the um, those inspectors, mold inspectors. Obviously, their incentive might be fraudulent. Their incentive is to um, to get business, and so they have an incentive to overstate the case. So. A few of the positions, you can certainly flesh this out more, but the insurance industry, they say mold shouldn't be covered at all. First of all, these are medical claims, and they're selling property insurance. They're not selling health insurance. The medical conditions were somewhat questionable, no conclusive links, but you saw in the Ballard video that there definitely are people who do have serious risk. The best thing to do is, is maintenance and inspection. Take care of your house. Look around. Watch for the water damage. If you had water damage, be proactive. Don't let it get out of control. Home builders are causing losses um, because of what they're constructing houses, and insurers have no control over that. The consumer group, they say malls should be covered without any limits, and insurers should be forced to stay in the state. Get rid of the Lloyd companies, um, and they say it is a health problem. Realtors, they just want a solution. The government just wants a solution. When I had Montemayor speak to my class on this issue, um, he definitely questioned the health issues. He took more of an industry side to this, and he thought his compromise was pretty good. I actually thought his compromise was pretty good as, as well. Here's his compromise. $5,000 uh, cap. You can buy additional coverage if you like. Um, 
it applies the 5000 applies to just about everything um, I'm not sure I can't remember and I couldn't find if the additional living expenses was covered as part of that $5,000 or not um, mold that results from water a water leak uh, it has to be mold that happened within 30 days of discovery so if someone sees a water leak on January 3rd and they don't do anything about it and in November they notice this huge amount of mold now of course the insurance industry in industries insurance company has to prove that they discovered it back in January but still once you have some proof that they discovered this that is problem um, mold that results has to be has to be reported within 30 days of discovery now I guess it's a little tricky um, is the mold discovered or the water leak discovered? I think this means 30 days of when the mold was discovered, but still, you might have a little bit of mold in January and it doesn't get serious until November and you don't do anything about it, then you wouldn't be covered. Uh, insurers are moving, even with this compromise, insurers are moving to the HOA. Um, the consumers, the 1%, is actually can be broken down even further. The 0.5% are those who, whose claims are more than the $5,000. They can buy some insurance. Uh, the, those that, whose claims are less than $5,000, they're fine because they, they still have insurance. Uh, the ones that are over that 0.5, they can't win with, with the insurance paying them out thousands of dollars. They can buy additional coverage. You know, it's interesting. Would you buy additional coverage? Well, if you think this is a big risk for you, then you probably have a mold issue in your house. If you've never had a mold issue, you probably wouldn't buy additional coverage. Mold isn't something I worry about at all. So, you know, it's 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 tricky. The 99.5%, the, those that their claims will be less than 5,000, they're happier because they're getting their coverage. The 99% who never file a claim, they're happy because they don't have to pay the higher insurance premiums. And this is what I think the consumer groups that are out there forget about. Insurance is passed through. You will, you will pay higher premiums if the courts require insurance companies to pay the full load here. Uh, the real estate groups, they supported the compromise um, so that the market would not go away. They could still buy homes. Um, Without a compromise, all policyholders are harmed, especially that 99% who never file a claim because their premiums can go up a bunch. They think the hype is temporary because, and this is kind of my sense, you may disagree with me, with me but I, I get the sense more and more that the Ballard case was incredibly unique. Opposed, the insurance industry opposes it, that most shouldn't be covered at all. They shouldn't be held for live or by construction, go, go sue the company that built your house. They don't believe in the health concerns. These remediators, they need to be regulated because they're they're finding mold everywhere. And then let the buyer decide. If they want mold coverage, then go find an insurance company that covers it. They don't want mold coverage, then let the insurance industry decide what they sell. Leave the government out of it. And then the consumer groups, you know, we had two groups opposing the insurance industry and these consumer groups that were representing that 0.5% that, that have these large claims. They don't want any restrictions. They say insurers are already outside the benchmark rate. Um, the insurance industry is saying, yeah, that's because the benchmark rate is completely inadequate. Um, the loss problems, and this is their case with the Ballards, is the reason the, the losses are so huge is because the insurance industry doesn't respond quickly enough. They let the mold issue get out of hand. I, I can't answer to that. You, and farmers certainly came across really bad in that video with the Ballards. And they claim insurers are shifting costs to insureds. Insurers are shifting costs to insureds, and I absolutely agree with that. That's what insurance companies do. <laughs> insurance is not some kind of gamble where the insurance company says, hey, we'll charge you 500. If your claims are 700, we win. I mean, we lose. If your claims are 300, we win. No, if the claims are 700, they're going to increase their premiums to cover that extra cost. And they're going to charge an expense load and a profit load. So if losses go up, premiums will go up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later. This will be more related to auto insurance. At the end of the semester, I'll show you another article. Well, people claim that the reason insurance premiums are so high is because insurance companies are just really sloppy with their expenses. They waste a lot of money. 
they hire people they don't need, they have all these boondoggles. Uh, we'll talk about that and see if there's any evidence for that. Um, all right, so there's there are the issues, pretty serious issues. You see the compromise, you see the issues. Then how does this apply the storm surge? So storm surge, these are high waves brought in by hurricane, hurricanes. The wind damage is covered, the storm surge is not. Per the policy language, it is not covered by homeowners policies. It's covered by flood policy. There's tremendous court support that storm surge is not covered. Now I realize, you know, Scruggs and Hood, maybe Trent Lott, they were trying to get that interpretation changed so that insurance companies would have to cover the storm surge part. They lost that argument. So essentially they wanted to force companies to rewrite their policies, their contracts retroactively. And I don't even know if it says rewrite, but they essentially reinterpret their contracts. So this, this didn't happen, it was being debated. If you did reinterpret this storm surge language, it would have been the mold case times a factor of who knows what. It would have been huge. It would have shut down homeowners insurance, especially along the coast of the U.S. Uh, I brought in the language from the State Farm here, so you can see it. Um, I think it's clear. Maybe State Farm should argue with the states to add the word storm surge to this language, but it seems pretty clear here. So that's what we're looking for. If you don't put in your answer something about the language of the insurance contract being reinterpreted by states and the way the actuaries didn't price for it, you will lose quite a few points there. So I will provide a rubric for this question. So when we get ready for the exam, we'll work, we'll walk through the rubric. All right, so here, here's a rubric. We'll, we'll get into this more when we get closer to the exam, but just to show you, provide some history of the mold. Talk about frequency and severity, give me some numbers there, including discussion about Texas rates being the highest. So you can put more words than here, but definitely the most important, 30% of the answer is give me a full discussion of how the wording of the contract, that interpretation by the courts, is extremely important. Some issues about is, whole, is mold really health risky, risky for people's health or not. A discussion who are the players, the insurer's reaction of leaving the market, or if not leaving the market, give a fuller answer here is either leaving the market or greatly restricting their coverage. Remember moving from HOB policies with all risk to HOA with a much more restricted. What was the compromise? So give me a little bit of discussion of the compromise. And then bring that link to storm surge. And most students on the storm surge, the answer is just terrible. And I don't know why. I can't make a clear link for what we're talking about. We're talking about language interpretation. The contract does not does not require insurance. Insurance companies do not cover storm surge. The language is very clear. But if courts were to reinterpret it and make storm surge required coverage, that would radically change the industry. So make sure you're really clear on that. I've said it many times, so I don't want to repeat it again. But just just to make it clear that um, the storm surge link, some, some students actually say that the courts interpreted storm surge as being covered. Some students didn't really know what the definition of storm surge was, so their answers were somewhat fishy. So uh, I know part of this because the exam's a, a little bit away, a few weeks off, and so some students just, just completely forget um, what we talked about in class. So you need, I, I would recommend you go ahead and draft your answer now while it's fresh in your mind and, and just, you know, spin up, you don't have much else to work on other than paper one. So, you know, work, work on that, uh, that language now, get everything down while you're thinking about it, while you've just gone through, you still remember the Ballard video, you still remember all of this, so you can give a much stronger answer. All right, so we're going, we're going to get to our second big issue with homeowners, which is catastrophes. I want to talk a little bit about catastrophes in general and then get into this calculation. We have two math problems on exam one, the problem maximum loss and the securitization of, of losses. And so they're fairly straightforward math problems, so we'll, we'll do them probably, probably some in next class. We'll get a little bit into it this class and define problem of maximum loss. But um, catastrophe risk is a huge issue for homeowners. It's these very low frequency but very high severity events, major hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, winter storms, 
There's a definition of a catastrophe. I'm not sure exactly what it is this year because it changes with the inflation. But um, companies know. There was when I was at USA, we knew if it was a catastrophe loss or not. It wasn't like oh, it's on the cusp. It might. We could go either way. They they knew there was there was very strict rules on what classified something as a catastrophe loss versus just a regular loss. There's some websites I've given here and some articles you can look like. The NOAA site is one I really recommend. Uh, I teach this class in the spring, but all the interesting stuff is in the fall. All the big hurricanes are in the fall, so it really doesn't make sense to go and look at their site now because there's just not going to be any hurricanes. And you remember watching the video that hurricanes need warm water. So obviously in the winter, when the northern hemisphere is having winter, waters are far too cool to create massive hurricanes. So this is really a, a summer and late summer type of phenomenon. Let's look at a few of these articles. Some of them are pretty dated, but I just want to give you a sense of what this means for the industry. If you're interviewing with the industry with a, a company in this industry that does homeowners, you'll definitely want to have some of these statistics ready to go so that you know those biggest losses and you know if they come up in discussion you can you can discuss them. So let me show you the NOAA site. What I did is I wanted to show you 2005 because 2005 is when Katrina hit. And I'll look at 2000. Uh, I'll look at Katrina here, but you can see that you can go any year and look at them. And what I really love is this thing right here, this chart they give us. You can see 2005 was in an extremely active hurricane season. And you can see which one's there. Number 11 is Katrina. So there's Katrina there. But Katrina actually, um, it, it went across Florida, came out, came back around. And it was a very interesting storm. Um, and some of these are a little bit hard to track because of just, just the, um, they cross so many times. But Katrina is very, very interesting. So um, they give you the dates. So Katrina was an August storm. Uh, most hurricanes, I think I've seen a few in November, are having a particularly warm fall, but you know most of them are June, July, August, September. You can see almost all of these were June to August. So just a massive. Now you compare that to say, I don't even know what 2020 was. Let's look at 2020. 2020 looks pretty active, but there weren't any you know, there were tropical storms versus hurricanes. Um, there was a few years where you got almost nothing. I can't remember what they were. Maybe 2010. No. If you just click through them, you'll you'll quickly see that there's some years that are much heavier than others. Here's a pretty light year here. Not so much. Well, wow. looks like they're increasing, so there's some global warming. 2011. So 2005 was a bad year. 2006 certainly a lot less so we had a few years where it was not quite as heavy but we usually have a, a few but most there's there's a quick you know some of these are not all that serious you have a depression or a storm that's probably not going to ca cause much property damage versus a, a hurricane so if we go back to 2005 when we look at hurricane katrina we can get much more specific on hurricane katrina uh, they'll give you quite a good write-up um, on each hurricane. Um, a lot of good data. I don't know if this could make a paper too, where you want to write about the impact of the most serious hurricanes in history and their impact on the insurance industry. What was the outcome? You might be able to do something. You can see that's a lot of, boy, just a lot of detail here. I was hoping they'd have some... Uh, some some charts, but it doesn't look like they do. Wow, a lot of information. I've never read one of these all the way through, so uh, it might be interesting. So yeah, here here's a chart that shows the path. All right, so this is what I wanted to show you. You can see how Katrina went across Florida, then went back out and got stronger, and then came came across here. So it was pretty strong when it hit Florida, but very very strong when it hit hit uh, New Orleans and so it did damage in both places this is a pretty serious storm that they hit hit twice it actually caused stop it did cause damage in South Florida not nearly as much as it did here so 
there's a picture of the actual eye of the storm. There it is after it's already past Florida and it's heading up. Now this is really interesting to me. We're going to talk about catastrophe bonds. One thing I wish we could do in the fall, and I'll have to just watch for this, if we have a major hurricane in the Gulf, but it, they don't know where it's going to hit, I would like to look at these catastrophe bonds, these bonds that actually insure against these massive hurricanes, and see what their prices are doing. I might be, you know, might be tempted to actually buy one of these bonds because they might get really, really cheap. Uh, a few other charts, not the charts I was hoping for. They have some some interesting charts uh, that, that give you a little bit of combine both the strength and the size of the storm. Here you just get the path without the size of the storm. So um, you might see some of the fan out ones that what that is is not the size of the storm but it's where it might hit and I wish I could show you that but we don't have any storms out there right now that I can show that to you so we had some other big storms in that same year uh, Rita was a pretty good sized storm so there was there was some others Wilma I remember so we had a few other fairly decent storms Katrina was a huge one but there were other ones out there as well if you go back to 2017 there's Hurricane Harvey so you can certainly, well, they've changed the report somewhat here. It looks a little more professional now, so it looks like they've cleaned up their, their reporting. Similar types of information, but a lot of meteorologist type of information. So if you want to look at the path, so here's actually Harvey comes across builds up strength. That's what the yellow and the red. So it was a major hurricane when it hit and it hit at just the worst possible place. It could have hit down here and would have caused almost no damage at all. This is, if y'all have ever driven this part of Texas, you can hit here and you might kill some rabbits and cows, but you're not going to do much, much property damage at all. The worst case scenario was a hurricane going up through the Houston channel. And that's exactly what Harvey did. Uh, and just caused tremendous damage, but most of the damage for Harvey was was flood. It wasn't wind, so it really depends um, on the type of storm and where it hits. Uh, you know, it's it it can be bad for the industry or not a big deal for the industry. And Harvey was not as big of a deal to the industry as it was for Houston because flood was such a big part of it. Here's an article: the 11 most expensive insurance losses in recent history. But this is an old article. But you might find that interesting. That gives a few of you Typhoon Maria in Japan, Hurricane Charlie, Hurricane Rita, mentioned them. Another one, 2005, Hurricane Wilma, another one we mentioned. So you can see 2005 is just uh, over, over what there's another 2005. Um, Northridge earthquake, a huge event, 9 11. Um, it's number four. Why isn't that higher? You would think that might be higher, but we're, I think this article is talking about insured losses, not total losses. Hurricane Andrew, that was a big deal for the insurance industry, $25 billion in losses. Um, that was a wake-up call for the insurance industry before Hurricane uh, Andrew. And remember, at USA, you know, our largest expected losses were a few hundred million dollars. After Andrew, those largest losses started becoming... 2 billion, 3 billion. Andrew really changed the industry's perspective. Um, Tokyo earthquake and tsunami in 2011, that was obviously a huge deal. And then Katrina is the biggest one at $72 billion. Um, so, yeah, some of the main reason I want to show you this is if you just do a search on 2005, you, you just see, you know, four, four of these storms. These massive storms or massive events were 2005. So 2005 was probably one of the worst years in the industry's history. Um, here's an article, a more recent article, 2020. I don't have this in your notes, but all you have to do is just, I just want to show you, all you do is just Google biggest uh, catastrophe losses, biggest insured catastrophe losses. So the way they look at losses is you can have total loss of property damage. So that's all the property damage. You can have total insured property damage. So that's just the part the insurance industry covers. So if there's a lot of flood, the insured part will be a much smaller 
than the actual losses, although the federal flood insurance will be part of that. They, they'll also look at these in terms of lives lost. So I think, I think Galveston still is one of the number one in the U.S. for lives lost. That hurricane happened many, many, many decades ago. Uh, but the lives lost was really high back then because um, the way things we the way we built things, our early warning systems. Indonesia had a, a tsunami not too long ago that, that killed hundreds of thousands of people. That might have been the largest loss of life in a storm like that in history. But so you can do it property damage, insured property damage, lives lost, all all of those are, are part of the records that they put down. So um, so you can see Japan has gotten hit quite heavily. Um, the floods you can see the U.S. is only only two of these, and both of those are floods. So um, this is the past decade, so it doesn't include the past decade. It hasn't been that bad of a decade for the U.S. Here's another one. It talks about global catastrophes and gives some really great charts. So I'll bring this up. I think I've had a couple of students do a catastrophe-related paper for paper two, and I think there's something there you'd really need one reason, one reason I think you can make a really good paper is there's a lot of data on this. This is something the insurance industry studies a lot. But you can't just write a paper on the biggest catastrophes. You have to find some way to ask, how does this, how does this impact the insurance market? What coverages are no longer provided because of this? Like floods, a good example. How has it impacted construction of houses and how is that impacted? I remember when I was at USA, there was a guy that was starting a company and his invention was using old tires to put houses, roofs on houses. And his argument was it could withstand massive, massive hurricanes, much stronger roof, it could handle hell storms because, you know, it was rubber, so hell would hit and would just bounce off. I don't know where he went with that. We never invested with him because he was kind of a bizarre fellow. Allstate, I think, had invested some with him. So how, how have all these catastrophes impacted the industry? Um, and so they, they give you some great information here. This is a pretty interesting chart. It's a few years old, a couple years old, but uh, nothing major has happened, you know, especially with COVID. Nothing major has hit since then. So these are probably pretty, pretty good. It goes through 2018. So a lot of data there. And then this one, again, this is a pretty dated one, 2016. Um, so Harvey wouldn't be in here, but it gives you... Um, some really good statistics. Hurricane Sandy, obviously, that was a it was a huge one. It hit New York. Um, it's really rare. In fact, just the point. I think you got this in the video on hurricanes. It's very rare for a hurricane to hit this far north and be that strong, because usually you'll you'll notice a hurricane that does this will turn usually turn right. They do turn left here and here in North Carolina, South Carolina, but this is a pretty rare one when a hurricane turned left and hit the upper northeast and there obviously is a lot of property damage there and then just pictures of it so I like this site I think it's a really good site so um, so think about it if you're really interested in a paper on catastrophes that's when I highly recommend the Swiss Re site because Swiss Re that's what they do they reinsure these large catastrophe type of events and so their website has a lot of information on this so try to find some angle. I think it's really interesting. Obviously, these are you know these are big big stories. Um, also, if you're interested, uh, the Texas Insurance, uh, the 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 Texas Insurance Council (TIC). And boy, I can't remember the name of it, but the group that's given us the scholarship, they have a video on one particular hurricane that's really interesting, and you could probably pull some data from that. Uh, I was tempted to show that to the class, but um, I, I don't, yeah, it's just sending you more and more videos to watch. Just, I didn't want to do that, but interesting stuff. So anyway, there's plenty of websites and I didn't have to spend hours finding these websites. So you, you'll notice like right here, there's a group called III. And here's another great place to go to look for a, a, a topic for your paper too. The III, the Insurance Information Institute. I should have had that in my list of... Um, links at the beginning of the notes but um, right there we're talking about that three reasons to take home inventory um, so a lot of good stuff here you might you might show some gap insurance we sold some of that when I was in the credit union you know just you might find some really interesting stuff here 
to do do a paper on. So what we'll we'll do next class is we're going to talk going to talk about probable maximum loss. If you are in my re risk management job class, we talk about value at risk. Probable maximum loss and value at risk are really one and the same thing. So if you understand value at risk, you understand PML. The biggest difference is value at risk for uh, for banks is usually a daily calculation. Um, for hedge funds, it's usually a daily calculation. For insurance companies, probable maximum loss is an annual number. It's not a daily number. It doesn't make sense to look at your daily risk of hurricanes. So it's an annual number. It's an aggregate number. So we'll get into that. You might want to look up the terms probable maximum loss and value at risk if you want to find some things to Google and just get, get a little background before we get into it. But next class, we'll start here. Here's two more websites that if you're looking for a great topic for your second paper, so let's say you want to do a topic on catastrophes. So Swiss Re, RMS, Air Worldwide, they will have a lot of information that might give you a great angle to take on the paper. So we'll start here next class. And finally, for the first time in our class, you're no, you're going to need a calculator. 